Hi everyone, my name is Dion Fuller and I'm a professor at the University of Toronto. Seeing as how we were all supposed to meet in person in Toronto, I thought I would come up to the roof of my apartment and show you the CN Tower and welcome you to the International Labour and Employment Relations Association Virtual Conference of 2020. Welcome to this asynchronous session, which is meant to give you a sneak preview of some of the contributions that will be forthcoming in the 2020 Labour and Employment Relations Association annual research volume. The volume is titled Reimagining the Governance of Work and Employment, which at the moment I find somewhat difficult to do, as we're currently in the midst of a global pandemic. The world is changing more rapidly each day than I have ever experienced in my lifetime. Because of this, it's becoming difficult for all of us to imagine what work and employment will actually look like beyond 2020. In an attempt to flatten the curve of the pandemic and avoid overwhelming healthcare systems, many of our countries have closed their borders and declared states of emergency. Many governments have ordered all non-essential businesses to cease in-person operations and have closed schools and daycares indefinitely. Labor market statistics capturing the early effects of COVID-19 and the economic shutdown that most countries are experiencing suggests that we are collectively experiencing one of the largest labor market shocks in recent history. It is unclear how long the physical distancing measures and de facto shutdown of the worldwide economy will last. And even once governments slowly start to lift restrictions, which is currently happening in my own country, Canada, it's unlikely that we will see a return to normalcy in the near future which does bring forth the question about whether or not a return to normalcy is what we really want anyway. It goes without saying, of course, that we would all like to see people stop dying from the virus and once again enjoy in-person celebrations with family and visits with friends. But do we really wish to return to the way we've been organizing the economy for the past four decades or more? Do we want to simply fall back on pre-crisis approaches to governing work and employment when the threat of the pandemic and virus itself has passed? Are we comfortable with the reality that many of our essential workers are also among the lowest paid in our societies? If not, then I think this research volume is timely because it's about reimagining some old ideas as well as proposing some new ones for the regulation of work and employment and the governance of our economies and labor markets. The world is slowly beginning to understand two things during this crisis that will not surprise members of the industrial relations community. The first is that society's most important existing resource to fight COVID-19 is our workers. And second, the meaning and value of work to society is not necessarily synonymous with what the people who perform that work are paid, nor even with their level of education. Essential workers during this crisis include not only healthcare professionals such as nurses and doctors, but also agricultural workers, long haul truckers and delivery drivers, personal support workers in long term care facilities, public servants, utility maintenance and sanitation workers, daycare workers and warehouse and grocery store clerks. These workers grow our food, care for the sick, transport food and medical supplies, ensure households receive clean water and income support, fix our utilities, pick up our garbage, feed the public and care for our children and the most vulnerable. Several of these jobs are among the lowest paid in our society. The response to the pandemic has generated three new classes of workers. First, those who have lost their jobs or who have had their work hours fully reduced. Second, those who have the luxury of being able to continue to work mostly or exclusively from home. And finally, those who continue to work mostly or exclusively outside the home. We are seeing several different labor relations challenges arising during the crisis relevant to these three new classes of workers. We're, see, we're seeing disputes arise over the right to refuse unsafe work under occupational health and safety legislation, the lack of personal protective equipment available to frontline workers, and other labor disruptions and work stoppages have occurred over legislated rights, as well as collective agreement provisions and conditions of employment that continue to change in real time as organizations are forced to adapt their operations in response to the crisis. 
Many workers at home do not have access to childcare or the appropriate tools to perform their jobs effectively. Inequities also exist among workers. Some employees are unable to come into work or perform their work from home, yet they remain employed and on organizational payrolls. Others have found that their work hours have been substantially increased or they've had to adjust their job responsibilities and duties to cover key business operations. There is also differential access to sick leave, benefit work, sick leave benefits across workers, which affects their decisions about whether to report to work when either they or a family member falls ill. At the same time, the demand for workers has increased in certain sectors of the economy, and some employees have even seen sizable hourly wage increases. These essential workers and those able to work from home are arguably the fortunate ones. Millions of others found themselves out of work almost overnight. Many business owners were forced to lay off most or all of their employees as their revenues evaporated. The same pressures apply to self-employed workers, including those in the gig economy. And the economic effects of the labor demand shock will not be felt equally. Early statistics in Canada suggest that jobs and hours lost are concentrated among low-income workers, as well as women and young people. We will also likely observe racial disparities in which workers must continue to expose themselves to the virus and which ones are able to work from home. The safety net for workers in most liberal market countries, particularly those with heavily decentralized labor markets, was woefully inadequate. Many of these countries previously relied heavily on long-standing programs like unemployment insurance to buffer workers from employment shocks. Yet these programs were unavailable to a large proportion of workers and low-income workers were eligible for very small benefits. As a result, new crisis support programs had to be introduced overnight by many governments. The field of industrial and employment relations is uniquely situated to help make sense of emergent labor relations issues affecting workers who continue to report to work, as well as those who work from home, and to help resolve emerging labor conflicts. Our field is well versed in understanding how organizations and businesses might respond to the crisis and what types of government policies are most and least effective for helping workers adversely impacted by the economic shutdown, and in particular, the most vulnerable workers. The Lira volume chapters pose several questions relevant to the current crisis and how we might restructure our society and economy post-crisis. And in this session, you will hear from approximately half of the contributors to this volume. Taken together, the chapters in the volume highlight that we need to think more systematically about connecting different policy domains, labor, health, development, immigration, business, fiscal, monetary, and social policy to address the complex challenges facing our society, both during and beyond the pandemic crisis. Many of the chapters suggest reviving decades old policy ideas to help us navigate the changing nature of work and economies. 20 contributors shared their ideas and expertise for this volume, and I'm so grateful to each one of them for dedicating their time to the project. While the chapters and commentaries were completed prior to the exponential increase in COVID-19 cases worldwide, some of the ideas proposed in this volume are being actively debated in several countries or have even been implemented in some form already. It remains to be seen whether the crisis policies and programs will be permanent or temporary, and whether we have the collective will to rebuild our economic and social and political institutions to focus on citizen and worker solidarity and community, rather than individual meritocracy and self-reliance. In her commentary on the volumes chapters, Lisa Jordan from the United Steelworkers nicely captures both the strengths and weaknesses of the current volume in the following quote by Marx. Ideas never lead beyond the established situation. They only lead beyond the ideas of the established situation. Ideas can accomplish absolutely nothing. To become real, ideas require people to apply a practical force. To apply this practical force, we need all hands on deck and require them to remain on deck post-crisis. 
the labor and employment relations community should be at the forefront of both the academic and policy debates outlined in this volume. The field should play a central role in charting a path toward implementation of some of these ideas post-crisis. We shouldn't waste the opportunity that the pandemic crisis provides for each of our respective countries to take a giant progressive leap forward on reimagining the governance of work and employment. We may never see another better opportunity to do so in our lifetime. Hi there, my name is Jason Spicer and I am one of the co-authors of National Living Wage Movements in a Regional World, The Fight for 15 in the United States, which is one of the chapters in this year's uh, Lira Annual Research Volume. My other uh, co-authors, uh, which I'm just going to walk you through a quick overview of, of the, the piece, my co-authors are Robert Manduka and Tamara Kay. Their affiliations are listed here, as you can see. And what this piece is about is it is about the most recent iteration of a living wage movement in the United States. Of course, living wage movements have a fairly long history, uh, particularly in And the most recent version, the fight for 15 in the United States over the last number of years has had a great deal of success in raising wages for millions of workers around the United States and has politically scale shifted or scaled up as social movement scholars might call it from the city level to states as well as the national level. That's great. Uh, but what we were concerned with looking at in this piece is the fact that we live in a regional economic world. Uh, where social scientists uh, across disciplines have shown that uh, the metropolitan area is the primary unit of the economy today under globalization, with different metropolitan areas, particularly in a large and economically diverse federal nation like the United States, are disparately affected by global economic forces at work. So given that, we wondered at the metropolitan or regional scale, Is it too high or too low even for some regions? If it's too high, it could uh, hamper employment and growth. If it's too low, it might not be effective. Second, what drives household costs in different metropolitan areas? The conventional thinking might be that a lot of the demand is uh, items like supply constrained housing markets. And if that's the case, uh, unless there's the ability to add to housing supply, uh, higher wages might merely drive housing costs and the need for an ever higher wager, wage up, right? So what are the actual drivers? And then finally, what role does variation in household uh, size and structure play in this as well? The aspects of the regional economic drivers for a living wage. We were curious then how this mapped onto the politics of scale shift as well as legislative preemption. Right. So as this movement has scaled up from the city to the state to the national scale in the United States, it's hit some stumbling blocks because American states, not regions, have primary jurisdictional power often over setting wages. And in some cases, states are preempting the ability of local uh, jurisdictions and municipalities to set a higher uh, wage rate than the state sets overall as the minimum wage. Right, so what we find using uh, several different data sources is that one, almost all American metropolitan areas have enough output in theory to support a $15 an hour wage for their population. Two, almost nowhere is a $15 an hour wage too high a threshold to meet basic living costs as estimated by uh, the components of a living wage by region, by household type, uh, with the data that we, we introduce and analyze in this, this uh, study. Next, housing is a driver in some places of uh, the need for a living wage, but not in all metropolitan areas. And in many, many metropolitan areas, other items like childcare, transit, healthcare, variably play a greater role 
in the cost of living than housing. And then finally, we find little statistical correlation between states seeking to preempt the ability of localities to set a higher wage floor and the within state metropolitan cost structure variation, meaning there's little statistical are doing is protecting low cost metropolitan areas that don't need a $15 an hour wage threshold from activist efforts to introduce a higher wage. Implications. What does it all mean? Well, the ultimate takeaway is we call for a geographically nuanced living wage target. This is something that since we've produced this, uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in the United States has been calling for. But to give you a little more detail, we conclude that wage floors alone may help, but they do need to be geographically appropriate and they may not be sufficient on their own. We think that living wage floors need to be combined with other strategies, given the variable drivers of costs for households that by Metro and given variable state level preemption of local wage floors. And these other strategies might include context appropriate efforts that reflect the local cost drivers. So if it's housing, more affordable housing construction. If it's uh, participating in economic activity, it could be employee ownership. If child and healthcare are issues, it could be more robust local social service provision as well, transit, et cetera. And ultimately unions have historically been strong uh, community partners at different times in history in delivering and providing some of these services. Right? In particular, American unions have a strong track record uh, in the past of working on uh, issues related to affordable housing. Right? So we don't see these efforts as necessarily acting uh, as a substitute for collective bargaining institutions like unions, but rather a complement. So that is uh, our, our quick review, and we hope you found it uh, interesting. Uh, thank you. Uh, and enjoy the rest of your early recession. Hello, my name is Mike Matthew, and I'll be presenting this chapter for my co-authors, Rachel Alex and Tina Succia. Our chapter looks at the role of collective bargaining in the digitized workplace. There's been an enormous amount of discussion around the changing technological landscape of modern work. In this chapter, we set out to do a few things. First, we discuss how advances in algorithmic management and employer surveillance is changing the organization of work. Second, we draw on past technological changes to place these advances in a larger arc of history. Finally, we examine the role of institutional actors like unions and the state in shaping our technological future. In this presentation, I want to focus on that final point, how institutions can shape the emergence and effects of technology on workers. As this image portrays, there is significant concern about the way that advances in technology will affect the labor force. Techno-optimists claim that advances in artificial intelligence will lead to the quote-unquote augmented worker workers who draw on new technological counterparts to achieve what they cannot yet do to them. There is some evidence for this too, such as cobots, small robots that eliminate routine tasks in the healthcare industry. Techno-pessimists, however, view advances in technology as replacing jobs, leading to job displacement and slowing wage growth. Our argument in this chapter is that technology is neither good nor bad, but is shaped by the path that institutional actors lay for it. In this chapter, we focus on how two institutional actors, labor unions and the state, can blunt the worst excesses of algorithmic management and advances in employer surveillance. For labor unions, we identify five areas where unions can use and shape emerging technology. First, labor unions can repurpose technology for the purposes of building worker power. Recent strikes, like the May 1st Instacart strike in the United States, were built using the power of social media and handheld internet devices. Research has found that labor organizations around the world are connecting through Facebook, Twitter, and other social media platforms to build worker power. This allows labor unions to organize and contact workers in remote locations, 
coordinate labor actions across vast distances. Second, labor unions can negotiate for individual skill assessment and transfers within organizations for individuals who could be displaced by technology in the short term. While unions will not be able to prevent all instances of technological displacement, these steps can help blunt the effects of new technology on the workforce. Third, Unions can develop digital tools to help workers organize and fight back against the aggressive employer tactics. Turk Opticon is a Google Chrome plugin designed by academics and Amazon Mechanical Turk workers to help these workers avoid abusive sellers. In the spirit of Turk Opticon, unions could develop their own digital tools to help recruit new members and help insulate workers from unexpected changes at work. Fourth, collective bargaining can clarify opaque work systems. When workers are managed by algorithms, workers are rarely informed about the exact rules they are required to follow. For example, Uber drivers are never told their minimum performance cutoff. They are just told that their ratings are getting close to deactivation. Bargaining over the rules of the algorithm would create new transparency for workers regarding how these technological systems are monitoring and disciplining. Finally, unions can negotiate for limitations on the gathering of data. Similar to unions negotiating for limitations on the contents and access to personnel files, unions could negotiate to limit what data is collected from workers and how those data are used. The state also plays a key role in shaping the effects of digital technology on work. Several countries, including Canada, have proposed a robot tax in order to encourage firms to invest in their workers. The state also has a long role in reskilling and for professions that are likely to face permanent replacement in the near term, reskilling workers to other high demand careers provides one possible solution. Finally, universal basic income, a policy that provides workers with a guaranteed minimum income, can help workers who are displaced by technology by granting them a stable income while they seek other work or training. These are a few of the many issues covered in this chapter. Thank you for listening to this presentation. If you have questions, please feel free to reach out to any of us at the emails listed below. Hi there, my name is Chris Wright from the University of Sydney and it's a great privilege to be asked to record a video for the ILERA Americas Congress. Uh, I'm going to be discussing the chapter that Stephen Clibborn and I contributed to the LIRA research volume. And let me start by congratulating Dion Pola for editing the volume. It looks like a great book and we were thrilled and delighted at the opportunity to uh, contribute a chapter based on our research on immigration and employment relations. And that's uh, the focus of our chapter, looking at immigration employment relations in the state. We focus on the state because of the three main actors in employment relations, the role of the state has received less attention when it comes to immigration uh, than the other two main actors, you know, workers and their representatives and employers and their representatives. And um, so in the chapter, we draw a distinction between two main dimensions of state activity when it comes to immigration and employment relations. Firstly, internal governance, which refers to the activities of the state once migrant workers are already in the labour market. And secondly, external governance, which refers to the state's labour immigration policy decisions, particularly related to immigration and selection, uh, immigration selection and control. And the second of these two dimensions, external governance has received relatively little attention in the employment relations field. And for that reason, that's what we uh, focus much of our chapter on. The chapter discusses three different aspects of the state's external governance activities. Uh, firstly, it examines the various factors that um, go into uh, state labour immigration policy decisions, such as the role of national identity and the extent to which immigration um, is constituted in national identity and how this in turn impacts upon um, you know, differences in um, and national policies around um, labour immigration, and and also the extent to which the different employment relations actors, you know, employer associations and unions, 
are engaged by the state in its labour immigration policy deliberations. The second aspect of the state's external governance that we examine relates to uh, national sovereignty and foreign policy decisions. So there's relatively little uh, attention given to these issues in employment relations, but we argue that these are vitally important for understanding the different policies of states around labour immigration. Uh, for example, you know, a, a state, uh, you know, whether it has um, good relations with um, other nation states or not, can be vitally important for determining you know, which migrants are allowed in to a labour market and which ones are not. And finally, we look at the concept of legitimacy, which we believe uh, goes a long way to understanding the complexity of labour immigration policy and particularly the state's role in it. So various political scientists have um, drawn attention to the role of legitimacy to try to understand you know, why states do what they do. You know, states have various imperatives you know, to keep um, um, to maintain economic accumulation. They have the uh, imperative to keep their citizens safe and secure. Um, and they have the imperative to maintain the pretense of fairness in their policy decisions. And we argue that immigration really brings the, these different uh, imperatives and the tensions between them into, star, into stark relief. Um, so, for example, a decision to restrict migration on the grounds that it um, reduces competition for workers already in the labour market can be um, solved by states as fair, but it can potentially undermine their um, imperatives to maintain the conditions for economic accumulation um, because such decisions can potentially restrict um, or make it harder for employers to recruit the skills they need, which can hamper their business activities more generally. Um, so in the chapter, we draw upon insights from these other fields, um, comparative, employment, uh, comparative political economy, political science and migration studies, to generate insights around the state's activities, which we believe are vitally important for employment relations researchers to understand. We greatly enjoyed writing the chapter um, and we hope that you enjoy, uh, you, that you take something out of it when you're reading it. Um, thanks again for the opportunity to contribute. Uh, we're sorry we can't be there in person for the ILEA America's uh, Congress, but we hope to see you all in person at some time very soon. Thanks. Hi, I'm Greg Distelhorst. I'm on the faculty here at the University of Toronto Center for Industrial Relations and Human Resources. And, you know, for me, one remarkable development of the 21st century has been the emergence of a new kind of labor regulator, the multinational corporation. Now, you might think that multinational corporations, all they do is seek profit in all corners of the globe. And yes, they certainly do that. But many of these same corporations also claim to do everything that our labor regulator does setting labor standards, inspecting workplaces, issuing citations for labor violations. Yeah, yeah, you know, we do that too. Um, and these aren't just some obscure companies you've never heard of. Uh, these are the most successful corporations in several major industries. Companies like Nike, Apple, Starbucks, uh, even Walmart claims to be a global labor regulator. And this raises a number of questions, uh, but for me, the big one is, are they any good at it? And so in the 2020 Lira research volume, the chapter Multinationals as Labor Regulators describes what makes these firms as, la as regulators distinctive from public regulators. And it then tries to distill roughly 20 years of research into stylized facts about how well they do this kind of regulation. So today I wanna to briefly set the scene for this somewhat extraordinary state of affairs and then highlight two important points to emerge from the research. So uh, to set the scene, Multinationals regulate labor standards in their global supply chains. They monitor and try to shape workplace practices in the factories or farms that make their products. Now, they don't own these factories, and so rather than directly setting policies, they're playing the role of regulator. In the early years, they did this in response to scandals and media exposés, but over time, these practices have become institutionalized. So many multinationals 
have systems of supply chain labor regulation in place without ever experiencing an activist campaign. And so with the spread of these systems through several industries, researchers have tried to pry data out of these corporations and investigate what they're doing in their supply chains. So today I'll present one main finding from that research and also an area of active research. Um, the first thing you need to, need to know from this research is that multinationals as labor regulators never achieve full compliance. So if you read the codes of conduct that multinationals adopt, they'll describe their labor standards as the minimum requirements for a factory to produce their garment or shoe or computer. However, when researchers have looked at labor compliance data collected by the multinationals themselves, they have consistently found that no multinational supply chain is in full compliance with these supposedly minimum standards. In fact, we often find high levels of violations even after factories are exposed to many rounds of private inspections. And this is really the most consistent finding from about 20 years of empirical research. And we see that in a variety of industries, clothing, toys, to agricultural products, and even electronics assembly. So to the extent we do see multinationals stimulating improvement in their supply chains, it's primarily about outcomes rather than processes. So for example, there's evidence that this kind of regulation can improve health and safety practices in factories. There's not much evidence that interventions from multinationals can create a new system of collective representation for workers. And so these limits naturally raise some questions. You know, how could this form of labor regulation then be improved. And so for my final point, I just want to focus on the commercial relationship between the multinationals and the firms that they claim to regulate. So, you know, one of the things that makes a corporation regulating labor standards distinct from a government labor regulator is the commercial relationship between the corporation and the target of regulation. So for example, when Nike inspects a factory in its supply chain, it also controls millions of dollars of business for that factory the government re labor regulator does not. And this commercial relationship creates some opportunities, like could multinationals use their market power in service of regulating labor standards? And it also creates some risks. So some commercial practices clearly make it harder for employers to comply. And so in the final section of this chapter, uh, it discusses these commercial relationships, some preconditions for their importance, and the emerging research on whether commercial relationships align with or undermine the goals of, of labor regulation by multinationals. So I appreciated the opportunity to very briefly introduce this chapter. Uh, please do feel free to reach out to me to continue the discussion. Thanks. Hello, my name is Courtney Cable and I'm a PhD student at the Center for Industrial Relations and Human Resources at the University of Toronto. And today I'll be talking about a chapter that I wrote with Professor Dion Poehler on the concept of a guaranteed basic income. So I'll start with a simple definition of what a basic income is. And it's essentially just a transfer, an unconditional transfer from the government to individuals or families that is sufficient to meet basic needs. And there are two um, different variants of a basic income. The first is called a universal basic income in which every individual receives the exact same amount from the government. So whether you have uh, no employment earnings or whether you have $100,000 you know, $100, of, of employment earnings, both of those people will receive the same amount under a universal basic income plan. Uh, the second version is called a, tar a targeted income uh, sorry, a negative income tax or a targeted basic income. And under that variant, uh, the benefit is reduced as your income increases. So as you earn more money in the labor market, you receive less of the basic income. And in that sense, it's targeted to those most in need or the lowest income individuals. And so in our chapter, we discuss why we think the universal version is largely infeasible and so in our chapter and in this talk, when I'm discussing basic income, I'm referring to the negative income tax version of a, of a basic income or a targeted version rather than the universal version. So the goal of our chapter on, basic, on the basic income guarantee is to outline and address the political economy issues associated with the design of a basic income in Canada, but most of um, the arguments that we make will apply outside of the country as well. Um, we, all, we also provide details of, 
a design for a revenue ne neutral and a politically feasible basic income. And in our chapter, we identify two main concerns of, pol of politicians, policymakers, and, and the average voter that uh, we think have prevented the implementation or realization of a basic income. So the first is the cost of a national basic income and the associated tax increases that may be required to finance it. And the second major concern or implementation barrier is work disincentives um, and concerns about fairness and reciprocity. And when we talk about work disincentives in our paper, we distinguish um, between real work disincentives and perceived work disincentives. So by real work dis disincentives, we mean the actual effect that a basic income might have on labor supply. So neoclassical economic theory would predict that a basic income will, will reduce incentives to work. So it'll induce individuals to leave the labor market or spend less time in the labor market um, by allowing individuals to use the basic income to purchase more leisure or buy more time out of the labor market. So um, that's what theory predicts. In terms of actual evidence, um, despite all of the pilots that have been conducted that are that are aiming to see what the labor supply effects of a basic income are. Um, there are a number of reasons that uh, Professor Polar and I believe that these results should be interpreted with caution that we outline in our chapter, and I encourage you to go read those. But so as of yet, because no country has implemented a full basic income policy, it is uh, largely unknown what the real labor supply effects of a basic income will be. So that, so, then we, then we discuss um, what we call perceived work disincentives. By this, we mean the general public's beliefs about how uh, recipients of the basic income will, will, re will respond to a large income transfer. In this sense, we think it is the public's beliefs about the fairness of a basic income rather than the actual effects it may have on labor supply that are preventing its implementation. So we argue that these feelings should not be discounted in designing basic income proposals because they are likely embedded in prevailing societal norms and values about the importance of work and about reciprocity or what individuals should be required to contrib contribute to their communities in exchange for access to public benefits. So it is this belief about reciprocity and fairness that has really led to generous benefits for seniors and children or those who, de who are deemed the um, deserving poor and rather inadequate inadequate benefits for working age individuals or those who are perceived the non-deserving poor. So I encourage viewers to read our chapter and learn about our very detailed basic income design proposal and just to briefly describe it we uh, our proposal is a hybrid basic income with an earning subsidy like the earned income tax credit in the United States and we believe that our hybrid design really helps to overcome these the both the real and perceived work disincentive issues outlined in in talk by requiring uh, recipients to contribute um, in the formal labor market. So feel free to contact either Dion and I with questions about our proposed basic in income design. We're happy to answer them. Thank you so much for watching. It's getting hard these days to open a newspaper or surf online to a news site without coming across some news story or editorial or uh, feature piece that proposes that COVID-19 has really given new legitimacy and energy to the idea of an income guarantee. But I want to suggest that there's another big idea that's slowly making its way into the discourse um, and that proponents say uh, could address some of our big societal challenges in a way that's better aligned with the cultural moment, uh, likely to generate more economic benefits, and because of those two considerations, likely to find more political favor, uh, public favor. That idea is a, a job guarantee um, for anyone willing and able to work. It'd be paid by the national government, but delivered locally through social economy enterprises, by which I mean not-for-profits and cooperatives. Now, proponents of a, this idea of a job guarantee are quick to point out that what they're 
putting on the table is not is not workfare. It's not meant to be coercive or deadening work, but rather meaningful, voluntary, humane work. Um, and the way they get there is by insisting on working through social economy enterprises. Uh, because of their not-for-profit nature, um, there should be less tendency to exploit workers for these kinds of traditional ditch digging jobs and instead create work that you can put into three buckets, uh, care for people, care for communities, or care for the environment. Now, like the income guarantee, the job guarantee draws an uh, inevitable degree of skepticism, right? So the idea sounds too big, too utopic, too big government. Um, there's questions about how the social economy would create the work. How could they accommodate flows in and out of the program? Uh, would people want the jobs? Um, is there any evidence that this could work? Have they done any pilot projects that suggest there's some some hope for this kind of idea and and perhaps the biggest question is how would you pay for it um, so along comes the community employment innovation project this is a federal pilot project that was created in the early 2000s um, delivered in Cape Breton an economically depressed part of Canada and the intent was to help people who are collecting employment insurance who'd lost their job who or who are on income assistance who uh, basically on welfare uh, to kind of reintegrate into the labor market, but to do so in a way that was different than traditional labor market intervention. So this, this intervention inadvertently aligned very strongly with the job guarantee proposals as they kind of exist now. So it was a federally funded, community driven, social economy created jobs program. And the people who took the work uh, had were able to keep all their ancillary benefits. This is an important design feature of the job guarantee as proposed. Uh, they had the option of leaving the program and coming back. Now they could not return to EI or income assistance and come back, although they could collect those if they left, uh, but there was no kind of in and out from those programs. However, they could leave for family reasons or other reasons. Um, and the program uh, had jobs that lasted up to three years uh, and again was democratically controlled at the local level. Now. The pilot project was carefully stu structured to kind of yield empirical and robust results. So the, the people who took up the program were in the treatment group and the researchers and the project uh, designers were careful to create controls where they matched demographically and otherwise candidates uh, who were in the program with people who were out of the program. And similarly, the, the researchers tried to match communities that were receiving the benefits of the treatment. Uh, with those who were not the control group. And so they, they could draw robust conclusions from comparing the two. And, and just to give you three or four big headline conclusions, um, one, there was strong take up from the program, less from the employment insurance people, more from the income insurance program people. Um, the EI people felt they had other options. Um, they could wait for a job to come back. Um, but the income assistance program people were much more likely to take up the work. Once the treatment group cohort took on work, they stayed in the program. And that was regardless of whether they were starting from an EI position or an income assistance position. The work was meaningful and substantive and created benefits for the uh, participants that extended well beyond the kind of narrow economic higher income benefits that they would get, uh, but also included these kind of enriched social networks, particularly bridging capital, um, networks of people who could help them um, find new work, help them problem solve career choices, those kinds of things that a lot of us take for granted, uh, the people who were in the program suddenly found themselves enriched by. Um, and the program had a net benefit to society. Now it's important to stress that it had a net cost to the federal government, so they were out money, they were able to recoup some money from savings on paying out income assistance and employment insurance, and also there were some kind of economic multiplier benefits. but. Overall, net net, they they had a net cash outlay, but from a societal perspective, there was a clear gain. Once you took in the benefits of the social capital, the enriched lives of the participants, the services and goods that were created by the social economy enterprises that otherwise would not have existed, when you factor all that into the equation, um, the the researchers estimate that for every dollar of federal spending, they created a dollar twenty one of net gain for society um, in terms of the employment and income assistant uh, support recipients and $1.61 in terms of the income assistance recipients. 
Um, so what do we what do we make of all this? I think the CEIP experiment provides some compelling evidence for thinking about a job guarantee on an equal footing with an income guarantee, not as a competing proposal, but as a complementary proposal. And just to illustrate what I mean, think about the COVID-19 crisis. And this is not my paper, this is a, an add-on. Um, if we'd had a job guarantee program, we could have, we could have had much more uh, flexibility, quick onboarding, but we also would have had a choice about putting the people who are receiving money to work. We could have asked them to sew masks. Uh, we could have asked them to work at food banks to support the re-entry or the reopening of daycares. We could have done a lot with those people to produce things that we still really need, right? Even in the midst of the lockdown. And alternatively, or complementary, we could have just asked them to stay home. And we could have transitioned from a job guarantee to an income guarantee with the promise of emerging eventually back to a job guarantee. And so you can see the two programs overlap and complement each other. And I think we should think of them that way. So a guaranteed income perhaps for the short term, maybe medium to long term for those who can't work, a job guarantee, uh, there are other circumstances. And I think the timing of a conversation about this issue is right. Hello, my name is Nathan Schneider, and I'm uh, Assistant Professor of Media Studies at the University of Colorado at Boulder, where I also direct the Media Enterprise Design Lab. I I'm talking to you today about a project uh, uh, around a concept I call digital Kelsoism. And, and the Kelsoism uh, refers to the broader frame and ideas of uh, Lewis Kelso, who was the inventor of the employee stock ownership plan. Uh, this is a, a mechanism that in the US allows about 14 million people to be co-owners of the businesses where they work. And this is a model that has been particularly effective in kind of uh, medium industrial and retail environments. Um, and not so useful for particular technical reasons in the uh, emerging online economy. Um, but actually, I would argue that uh, the broader thought uh, behind what became the ESOP actually is very applicable and, and should be reconsidered in light of the challenges of the digital economy. Uh, now, it's ironic that um, Kelso is best known for inventing a tool for employee ownership, when actually his broader vision uh, as a lawyer and, and kind of policy entrepreneur was for a world in which, um, in which people were less dependent on the economic or on the employment relationship for their economic lives. Uh, that they were um, like the people, uh, the, the wealthier people who were his clients as a lawyer, uh, uh, that more people were deriving income from capital ownership um, and particularly ownership of assets that they had some relationship with, either as customers or neighbors or um, citizens. Um, so he saw a vision in which um, you know, people might continue to work, but more and more of their income and more and more of their time is able to be devoted uh, and derived from uh, 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 non-employment uh, uh, relationships and, and uh, other kinds of of uh, and, and as particularly asset ownership. So he devised a, a number of schemes that would enable people um, through external financing to become owners of businesses that they interact with and use, whether it's their grocery store, or utility company, or you know a, a public works project in their city, um, things that um, are, are productive and that could be revenue generating um, and that would benefit from uh, a, an economic relationship with uh, potential constituents. Um, and, and like uh, the, the, the you know, behavior of the capitalist class that Kelso interacted with, um, these, these acquisitions would be financed. So um, he devised a scheme of public financing to enable what he called undercapitalized people to become owners of these assets. Um, and uh, so that they're not putting up the cash up front. This is just like what how the, you know, the current ESOP model works. And I think this is a, a particularly important in the context of the digital economy where fewer and fewer 
people are directly being employed by you know the large platform companies whether because they're working as gig workers or as um, as contributors of personal data or other valuable assets the employment relationship is just not necessarily the, the driving force of this economy and I think we need uh, new frames for thinking about how people um, uh, really obtain benefits from their contributions to this economy and the the Kelsoist vision and proposals I think can offer some really interesting tools um, for instance he proposed a, a, something he called the the um, capital diffusion reinsurance corporation something that would incentivize lenders to um, to to lend to under groups of undercapitalized people uh, to become owners of companies that they interact with um, now this leaves us with the question of whether we really want the world that he envisioned one in which employment is not the primary uh, economic relationship uh, or whether we want to double down particularly in a moment of employment crisis on um, on rebuilding uh, something close to full employment um, uh, Kelso would would argue we shouldn't go in that direction. We should move toward a world in which capital ownership is is more primary, and that when you distribute capital ownership more widely and more equitably, um, you kind of transform the nature of capitalism as such. You know that's a debate I think that we need to be having much more. Um, I'm not sure where it lands, um, but um, but I think it, you know the time is right to be asking these big questions. Thank you so much. I would like to thank all of the volume contributors who created a short video today to provide you a sneak preview of what is coming out in the 2020 Labor and Employment Relations Annual Research Volume that will be available late this summer, early fall through Cornell University Press. Um, there's a lot more where that came from. Uh, you only saw about half of the uh, contributors present some of their ideas in this asynchronous online session. So I encourage you to uh, get a copy of the volume and to explore the ideas that the, that the contributors have put together. There's also several commentaries that um, are included at the end of the volume from a management side professional, a union side professional, and an academic where they uh, critique and discuss some of the ideas that are proposed in the volume. Um, I would like to thank all of you for uh, joining us in this asynchronous online session and I hope that you enjoy the rest of iLira 2020.